So shadows have been fundamental to astronomy for 2,000 years. Shadows were used to fix the distance between the Earth and the sun. Shadows were used um, to look at eclipses. Shadows were used by Galileo to show that there were mountains on the moon by looking at the crater edges that were illuminated uh, by the sunlight. And he used this to calculate that there were mountains that were several kilometers high. And so the moon was not perfect as Aristotle had thought. And so this was a great change in the whole cosmology uh, of, of the world. But shadows continue to be important. And for those of us who are working on the problem of trying to make images of black holes, we need the shadows because we can't see the black hole itself. They emit no light. No light is reflected off them. Instead, they bend the light around them. And this is a, uh, an animation of what happens uh, with light as it is launched from anywhere, comes around the black hole, and is sent off to us. So some of these photons, some of this light comes from hot gas around the black hole. Some of the light arrives from distant stars and other sources. But all of this light is constantly being circulated around the black hole and sent to us, where the black hole itself absorbs the light in the center and creates this shadow, this silhouette. And so what we see when we see this ring around the black hole, um, we, are, we are looking at the shadow of the, this, the dark part in the middle is the black hole itself. Well, you might say we need to process this image in all many different ways. We need to use computers. Indeed, we have supercomputers that are necessary to be able to create these images. So if we need to process this data, if it has to be digitally organized and calculated, is it really an image? But when you take your cell phone, the cell phone is a computer, and it does an immense amount of work to make those pictures that we take every day. When we make a selfie, we are using a highly sophisticated set of algorithms and computers to produce that image. So we can say that taking a picture can involve a lot of electronics, computation, and algorithms. Now we're seeing a silhouette. One of my favorite cinematographers, Roger Deakins, uses silhouettes all the time. So when you see these images of somebody in silhouette, we nonetheless think of ourselves as seeing the image. We're seeing the woman walking down the aisle there. We see somebody fleeing. We see soldiers on the horizon in silhouette. Silhouettes are still a form of seeing the world around us. Now, one of the great triumphs of modern observational astronomy has been the work that looks at the center of the Milky Way, the center of our galaxy. We suspect that every galaxy has a giant, a supermassive black hole at its center. And the Milky Way, although it's big, isn't nearly as big as the distances between galaxies. So the first picture that we made of a black hole in 2019 was 55 million light years away. This one, this, this one at the center of the Milky Way is only 25,000 light years away. So when the light was launched from near the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, there were humans on the Earth. So two astronomers, Andrea Gez and Reinhard Gensel, used very sophisticated optical telescopes to make an image of the stars that were around the center of the Milky Way. And amazingly, they could actually see the orbits of these stars being pulled around the empty center, the supposedly empty center of the Milky Way. And from their orbits, you could actually deduce that there 
was some enormously massive object, even though we couldn't see it. Another way that we've begun to look at, that scientists have begun to look at black holes, is by looking at the way they disturb space itself, the way they create waves in space. The experiment LIGO, which has bases in um, Louisiana in the United States and in Washington State, in, in Italy, and new sites are being made in India and, and, and in Asia. But these stations have very sensitive giant mirrors which move as space is, is, is thrown into disturbance when two little black holes merge. Little, I mean, the size of a city. Uh, little, I mean, the product of the collapse of a star, like the sun, or 10 times as big as the sun. But there are no pictures. So we have pictures of stars pretty far from the black hole moving around it, and we have no pictures of black holes when they're close together. That's what the Event Horizon Telescope is designed to fill in, to make an image of the area immediately outside the event horizon, the surface of no return, where you could fall in, but you can never send a signal out or much less get out. And so this event horizon telescope was a project uh, that I've been participating in for the last five or six years and about which I'm, I, I made this, this film, The Edge of All We Know. This produces an enormous amount of data, uh, petabytes of data each year night, which is more than has ever been produced in any experiment in the history of science. And these create volumes of data that go on to hard drives. The hard drives have to be carried back by airplane or by package from all over the world where these radio telescopes are located because it's much too much information to go over the internet. So as the Earth turns, the different telescopes form pairs, and these pairs, these connected pairs of telescopes uh, are the fundamental measuring unit of uh, images in deep space. We're trying to take a picture of something that is as if you were taking a, um, a, a coin, and I held it up here in, in Massachusetts, and you were to look at the date on it <clears throat> from Spain. That's how, that's how tiny it is. It's like holding an atom out at the length of your arm or looking at um, uh, uh, an orange on the surface of the moon from the earth. These are tiny specks on the sky. And so we need these pairs of telescopes. And as the pairs of telescopes turn, as, we, as the earth turns, more and more telescopes come to face the black hole, and it begins to fill in the measurements, simulating a giant telescope the size of the Earth itself. It's as if we had a single mirror of an old-fashioned optical telescope with shards in different places, different pieces of the mirror, and then we combine those to make an image. So the Event Horizon Telescope is actually a consortium of different telescopes in Chile and in France and in, in, in Arizona and in the United States, in the North, in the South Pole and in Greenland, all over the Earth. And we combine their information to create an image of the Earth-sized telescope. The problem is the image is very fragmentary. We only have pieces of it like as if you had only gotten a few pieces of a torn up picture and you had to recreate it. So if I said to you, you know, separate the blue dots and the red dots, you would say, well, what do you mean? Do you mean find the best circle that separates them approximately or the best ellipse? Or do you want me to exactly draw a green line separating the blue from the red? The question of separating blue and red dots is not clear. You need to specify more to be able to do the task. And that's what the Event Horizon Telescope had to do. We have these fragments of a picture, and we need to say something to the computer so that the computer can fill in all the parts we're not seeing. So one of the things we did was took four different groups, or 
sometimes six different groups and, and sent them pretend data and said, each of these groups had a computer, had big computers, and they, we said, reconstruct the image as best you can. And so we took real data, for instance, these pictures on the top row, a, a, a photographer you see where it says natural, astronomical images, blurry, uh, so that they would simulate the kinds of things we would see through a telescope or simulated versions of black holes. And then we asked all the different groups to do the best job they could to fill in the gaps in their sparse data. And you see some of the results here. Some of them look like what they're supposed to look like. Some of them you can't recognize at all. The photographer in the top row is, done, is captured you know, somewhat well in the, in the final line there, the final row called chirp. But the other groups weren't successful at all. So we worked and worked until every, all the different groups who were not talking to each other could recreate the image. We even tried sending out an image that nobody would expect, like this snowman, to test whether each of the groups was really recreating an image or whether they were trying to guess what it might be. We wanted them to be honest and have their computers produce the images. And you see here, you know, the snowman is pretty well reconstructed by several of these programs. But we, went, we were very careful about this, and you know, we put up in each of the rooms, for instance, papers so that the other groups couldn't see in to see what they were doing. We wanted everybody to be completely honest about their ability to recreate these images from pretend data. And then in June of 2018, this is the first time anybody on the planet ever saw an image of a black hole, and I'd like to play a few, a, a minute or so of this for you. This is from the film, The Edge of All We Know. For me, I'm not, like, you know, I'm just saying, like, for, I think it'd be fun for us all to do the first one together, see that it's shit, and then go off in our own little ways and, and fix it. I mean, I think it's just, like, it's so exciting that you, do you want to do it alone? I, I would like to see it all together so we can get, get some idea of the data. Are you yes. ready? Ready. Ready? Is that going to work at all? <laughs> I'm just going to do enhance, enhance, enhance. Ready? <laughs> Set. Go. go. Oh my god! Oh my god, we press go. It's just a waffle. Oh. <laughs> that looks really, really interesting. How's the waffling going? Andrew looks beautiful, but he, there's no tweaking involved. <laughs> Is with a huge I think Daniel and I were both getting something like this. So each of the different groups eventually began to get something that looked like this. And that gave us hope that we were really seeing something real. We blurred them all to be the same level of blurriness. And then all the groups got together in July of 2018, and we saw that, amazingly enough, they all had a, a, a ring of the same size with the bright arc in the south. And, um, it then, and then there was another year almost of testing to make sure that we weren't all missing something, that we were really seeing something real and that wouldn't go away. We tested our programs again on rings and crescents and disks and double blobs. We tuned them in different ways. We took the data that was, we let the computer try to make the best image that it could, and then took its settings to try on the real data and said, would it make a ring? And it did. So we tried all these different ways uh, on fake data, let the computer find the best way of recreating it and then applying it to the real data. And no matter what we did, we kept getting the ring with the bright uh, in the South. And then we took all these different methods um, on with the best day that we had. We need good weather all around the world. And we said, let's take all of them and average them together to, um, to give an image that would emphasize the things that were real, that were common to them all, and, the, and de-emphasize the things that were peculiar to one method rather than another. 
And that became the image that we released and that was seen by a billion people in the few days after the 10th of April, 2019. But what's next? Well, quite soon, I think the uh, Event Horizon Telescope will have more to say uh, about various things that I'm not supposed to talk about yet. But one of our long-term goals uh, is to be able to make movies. Now, Galileo did that back in 1610. He took, he drew the pictures of Jupiter and these, what he called the Medician stars around it, the, what we call the moons of Jupiter. And day to day, they're like movie frames. And if you play them one after the other, you can see how they moved. And this was another blow that Galileo could strike against the older Aristotelian forms of cosmology. Because if the world had really been made of glass spheres in which that moved around in, perf in, in, in perfect circularity, then these moons would have crashed through and broken the glass spheres. And that's what we hope, what we hope to do with the, eventually with the Event Horizon Telescope is also to be able to make movies, to be able to understand in detail what's going on in the flow of matter and hot gas uh, all around uh, the black hole. Uh, so that's a, a, few, <laughs> a few brief remarks on trying to actually see these strange objects. This black hole that you're looking at here is three times the size of our solar system. It's the most mysterious, exciting, generative, in some ways terrifying object uh, that you can imagine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was uh, amazing. So now we have uh, like about 10 minutes for Q&A. So I wonder if there is someone that wants to make any, any questions. We have one here. Hi. Um, thanks for making this information available in a beginner-friendly way. Uh, I have so many questions. Uh, it's fascinating what, what you've just shared with us. But okay, so from my understanding, and I'm an artist, I'm a VR filmmaker, I once saw an immersive uh, film about uh, the end of the universe being completely empty, empty like, right? Because of the absence of light, and also because we keep driving apart from each other. And what I thought I understood about black holes is that. They're a hole in three dimensions. So, like a sphere, that's the emptiness, right? And you've just showed us uh, this silhouette uh, representation of a black hole. And it's the first time that I actually wonder, is, is that how you see a black hole from every perspective in space? Like, from any point of the universe when you try to look at the one or, well, a black hole, what you see is a silhouette. Like it's the empty center and you, it, it actually looks like a shiny emptiness because it's bouncing light. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm amazed. <laughs> Can you confirm? <laughs> is this what it looks like from every point on the, on the universe? <laughs> It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, so what you're seeing, uh, m the, the, the main thing you're seeing is this very hot gas that is in orbit around the black hole. And that, that gas then, some of it, when it, on its way to us, is absorbed by the black hole. Some of it goes off into space and some of it forms a kind of ring around this silhouette formed by the black hole. And if the... If the gas was equally everywhere around the black hole, it would look exactly the same everywhere in space. But sometimes the gas can form a disk, like the rings of Saturn. If it formed the rings of like a, a flat disk or, uh, around, the, around the black hole, the way the rings of Saturn form a disk around, the, uh, around that planet, then it would look a little different. You would always see some kind of a shadow, but the shape might look 
for instance, a little bit like the picture that you saw, you might have seen in the fiction film Interstellar. And then it would depend on the inclination that you were at with, you know, are you looking at the rings head on? Are you looking at it from, you know, if you imagine the rings at the equator, and then if you're looking at it from the North Pole or the South Pole, it would look different than if you were looking at it head on. So a lot depends on whether the gas around it is in a disk or is it everywhere or is it in a big fluffy cloud that's kind of a disk and that will shape somewhat the perspectival differences but you'll always see a shadow of a black hole no matter where you are but it's the exact shape of the brightness around it would be different. I'm sorry you said the black hole has poles? Well, I talk about it as poles. If the black hole is spinning, you can think of it as having a, 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 the poles around which it's, 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 it's orbiting. Is it, is it spinning, though? Most black holes, the, like the, big, the one that we took a picture of, like the one behind me in this picture, if you can see in my image, that one is, is definitely spinning. And the reason we know it's spinning is that it shoots out these huge jets of, of hot, gas of plasma that can go distances of many galaxies. They're gigantic. They were seen by astronomers uh, 110 years ago uh, with, the, with the telescopes of, the, of, of 1909. So um, these are gigantic things, these jets. And our best understanding is they're caused by the black hole spinning and it creates these magnetic fields around the north and south poles, so to speak. That's a lot of new information, okay, um, thank you. <laughs> okay. Is there, is there any other questions someone wants to make? Hi there, um, thanks so much for, for speaking to us and, ex and explaining this stuff, it's very interesting. Um, it seems to me there, there, must be, there must be quite a challenge involved in coordinating these telescopes uh, in the sense of coordinating them or synchronizing them in time like in, in order to make sure that data is captured at the same at exactly the same moment can you maybe talk a little bit about how that was about how that was achieved yes it's a very good point we really need to have the telescopes the timing of the telescopes extremely precise as if they were the surface of a single radio telescope the size of the Earth. So the first thing that we do is to put an atomic clock at every telescope. And without an atomic clock, the timing is hopeless. But even with an atomic clock, we then have all this data, those like those big hard drives that I showed you in the, in the slide a moment ago. They're brought back to a supercomputer, one in Germany and one here in Massachusetts in the United States. And the computer aligns them, you know, takes the data from all of them and, and lines up almost wave by wave uh, of, you know, wave of this infrared light by wave of, by peak of this infrared light. And it's only by doing that, which means billionths of a second. So the, the computer then does that until you see these, this, this correlation among the different uh, telescopes data. So your question is a very important one and aligning the timing of the different telescopes is the condition without which no observation can be made. This is the fundamental necessity. One of the things that we're starting to think about now is you know, could we put a telescope in orbit around the Earth? Could we put a telescope eventually on the moon, a radio telescope on the moon? And to do that, one of the things, the challenges is we have to, they have to come with their own atomic clocks, and then we have to get back this enormous amount of data from them so that they too can be put in, that data too can be put into the supercomputer and aligned to get this uh, correlation among the incoming waves from the black hole from all of the telescopes have to be lined up as if it was a single surface of a dish. Thank you. Actually, I, I potentially have a follow-up question if it's okay. Um, I, I, the, you, you showed us the, this image of the, of the hard drives and mentioned that they have to be physically transported because the internet wouldn't, just wouldn't have the, the bandwidth to, 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 to transfer this data. Right. 
Is there, I mean, is there, is there potential that you're aware of for, for example, if, if, if we had a, a telescope on the moon or in orbit, that is, is the idea that it would be the same process? You would have to physically transport it? Or is the idea that no, technology would, you would you, Yes. You would want to use laser communication and uh, that's a challenge. I mean, it, 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 right now we don't have it, but there are, there's work. I mean, lots of people, not just uh, us black hole hunters, would like to be able to send massive amounts of data uh, using lasers. So if, if that technology, that technology will be very important. For example, if you had, you, one thing you could do, which is, something I've been very interested in is if you had a telescope that came close to the Earth and then went far out, but it was in an orbit that was eccentric. It was, it was going close to the Earth, then far from the Earth, then close to the Earth, then far from the Earth. Then maybe you could make your measurements when it was far from the Earth. So you had this long baseline, which make, simulates a much bigger telescope, but then comes back closer to the Earth, and that's when you dump the data. So with a laser, that would be... That's, I mean, not something we know how to do today, but we're hoping that that will be a technology that will become possible. Making an orbit like that is not a problem. Transferring the data is difficult. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, we have time for one more question. Tim? <clears throat> Sorry. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the talk and, well, and for the film which we saw last week. Um, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around um, the, like, the idea of this massive array of telescopes as a camera um, and as this kind of image-making apparatus. And I don't know if I'm taking the kind of metaphor as telescopes or camera kind of too literally, but like, I was wondering like, to what extent, if any, there were sort of aesthetic judgments involved in making this image and in the process of kind of in the process of realizing this image, like uh, we've talked a lot about the sort of the level of objectivity it has, but I'd be very interested in, I guess, the other side of it, like what judgments had to be made in terms of producing an image, producing a representation, and kind of uh, to what extent that was necessary, and I guess how you went about it. No, it's a very good question. So I'll give you one example um, of, a, of a, an aesthetic judgment that was important. And that was that uh, the brightness and darkness of this image, the one that's behind my head here, uh, is given by the data in, you know, with recognizing all the complexity that, that, that um, we were just talking about, about having to fill in the sparse image and so on. But the color is not. The color is no part of the data. This is the, this, the, the radio signals that we're getting are not visible to humans. They're in the infrared. So you have to make a decision. Just the way when you put on night vision glasses, someone's making a decision that it should be green or blue or yellow. That's a decision that's made for you know, what, whatever reason. Um, and in our case, we had a big discussion about what color we, the underlying color should be. And, after some discussion, the argument came down to blue or orange. And uh, one of my colleagues said, but I, you know, the, the blue part of a flame is the hottest part. Shouldn't we use that to represent this 10 billion degree plasma that's orbiting the black hole? Because blue is just so hot you know, for a scientist. And um, I, I didn't agree with that because you know, if you put a if you put a symbol in color on a stove to warn people not to touch, you use orange or red. If you want somebody to buy a refrigerator, which is very cold, you put a blue, like blue ice. Like, not, you don't make red ice on a, on a, on a refrigerator. So I, I thought that orange would be um, evocative of the heat of this, uh, of, of the surrounding, the, the blackness of the black hole itself. And, you know, we had a lot of discussions and uh, many people had other opinions and we all talked about this a lot. Uh, but in the end, the, the orange won out, but that's an aesthetic decision. Straight aesthetic decision. Um, now, you know, the black and the black hole 
uh, in the middle is not, the, you know, exactly the same as the black of the blackness of space, but it's it's um, it gives you a pretty good idea. That's where the that is that is the part of the universe that we have no access to. That is the black hole. Uh, I mean, the, you, you saw in the film, which I, I found, uh, I, I, thought, I still find one of the best ways of explaining some of these things is that you can think of a black hole like a vortex in a bathtub. And, you know, if you, if you, get, too clo you, know, if you get too close to it and you're a fish, you're going to go down the drain. And if you are not too close, you can swim away. But there's a point when the inflow uh, of water is faster than a fish can swim, and then everything is going down the drain. And that's the same for the black hole. You could, if you were in a spaceship, you could escape until you get to the horizon, and then it's space itself that's falling in, and it would require going faster than the speed of light to escape, and nothing can do that. So nothing is going to get out uh, once you cross the horizon. The horizon is where the velocity of space cascading in is faster than the speed of light. 